You listen to this podcast because you like books, or maybe because you like learning, or maybe you just like the sound of my voice lulling you to sleep. If it's the first two, Audible has you covered. Too busy to read? Driving and don't want to run into another dog? Audible is a huge library of audiobooks where people read to you like you're a kid again. And guess what? You can try it out for free. Just go to readlearnlivepodcast.com slash audible to sign up for your free trial today. Stoicism is about self-improvement, not, not going around telling other people what to do or what not to do. Right? Now, if other people ask you, and uh, fine, then, then you tell them, I say, well, here's what I do and here's why I do it. Right? But it's really about self-improvement. It's really about um, talking to yourself, reflecting, being mindful of what you are doing and are you holding up to your own ideals and expectations and things like that. And if not, what can you do to, Im- to improve that sort of thing, right? Hello and welcome to Read, Learn, Live, the podcast about improving yourself through literature. I'm your acclaimed host, John Monaster, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 13. Today, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with Massimo Piliucci about his book, How to Be a Stoic, Using Ancient Philosophy to Live a Modern Life. Massimo is a philosopher of science and evolutionary biologist at the City College of New York. He holds PhDs in genetics, evolutionary biology, and philosophy. His areas of research include the nature of evolutionary theory and the phenomenon of pseudoscience. He has written for many outlets, including the New York Times, and has written or edited 10 books. He blogs at platofootnote.org and howtobeastoic.org. I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to Read, Learn, Live. I am John Monaster, and I am really excited to be here today with Massimo Piluici, author of How to Be a Stoic, Using Ancient Philosophy to Live a Modern Life. Massimo, say hello. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being on. I'm really excited because this book was really interesting and fun and also, I think, perfectly aligns with the sort of core mission of the podcast to help us improve ourselves. Good. Thank you. books. Yeah. So uh, I always like to start off by asking the author for, for a summary of the book as best you can. Yeah, uh, fair question. <laughs> the The book is basically an exploration of the basics of the philosophy of Stoicism, which is an ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, uh, which have ca- has come back recently uh, to uh, because it's useful. It's, uh, it's, it's been useful 2,000 years ago, and it's useful today. Uh, but what I wanted to do was to present Stoicism in a non-academic uh, fashion, and also not too much in a sort of a self-helpy kind of fashion, p- partly because that's not my style, partly because those things are already out there, and so there's no, no point in duplicating things. So the way the book is structured is... Um, as a ongoing conversation with Epictetus. Epictetus was one of the major ancient Stoics, um, the one that actually has made a particular impact on me. So I picked him, and I imagine having, uh, you know, walks w- and conversations with him uh, in Rome. And in fact, when I was writing the book, I was in Rome, as it turns out. I was actually having those uh, uh, those walks by the forum or by the Colosseum that I describe, except, of course, that Epictetus was just in my imagination and not <laughs> not real. So every chapter deals with a different issue, uh, either a practical issue or a different aspect of Stoic philosophy. So there is a a chapter on uh, love and friendship. There is one on uh, anxiety and fear. Uh, But then there are also more theoretical ones. There is one that explains the fundamental concept of the dichotomy of control uh, that was crucial for for Stoic philosophy. But every time uh, the book starts out with either a situation, an actual situation that I found myself in, these, these are not made up, um, and you know, most of them are kind of everyday situations. There are a couple of exceptions. At one point I found myself in the middle of a coup d'etat in Turkey, for instance. That's not an everyday situation, but, um, but I thought that was interesting <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Epictetus sort of says his thing, usually with a quote, almost, almost verbatim quote from the Discourses, which is his main book. Uh, and then from there, I take it from there and, and sort of explore um, uh, in the most clear way possible the, the specific topic. 
Um, so I like to ask a few questions about the writing process and what the writing was like. I, I like writing, I think, and since we're seeing and can add some background. So I think I'll start off by asking what your process was like while you were writing the book. You, I know you said you were taking these walks. Uh, what else were you doing? What was your schedule like? So this was a rather unusual because it was the first book that I written that was during a sabbatical. So I actually had uh, time to devote almost exclusively to this project. I mean, you never do only one thing, at least not in modern life, right? You, you still have to keep up with email and yeah. uh, minor projects and all that. But it was a luxury, actually, to be able to uh, spend four months in Rome and then another three or four in New York uh, writing and editing the, the book uh, as my major top, um, sort of major um uh, project. Then the actual writing was, uh, I actually was surprised, frankly, because, so I, as you as you were saying uh, earlier about yourself, I love writing. I've been writing since I can remember. I mean, uh, I, I grew up with my grandparents and my grandfather gave me a typewriter when I, when I was in early middle school and I started you know, typing on this thing. I never stopped as far as I, I can tell. Um, so I do have a, a facility of writing. I mean, I, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't. It's not a difficult thing for me to do. In, in fact, it's a pleasurable thing. Um, but in this particular case, it was so easy. Mm -hmm. uh, it was amazing. Partly, probably, was because it was a different environment. So I, I rented an apartment in Rome, right around the corner uh, from the Colosseum. Literally, uh, I would just go downstairs, round the corner, and that was the Colosseum. And so I. I had the, the the luxury, as I said, to, of spending several hours every day. Uh, I would get up at um, a reasonable time on my own, no alarm clocks, uh, and then I would make my coffee and I will start uh, writing or looking at my notes and preparing for writing. And then I will do, you know, maybe two or three hours of this, and then go out for a walk and have lunch in a nice little cafe nearby, and then go back and do another two or three hours, then another. Uh, walk and a break and uh and some more writing before dinner and then it would be aperitivo time so you go out with friends or family which i have in rome uh, and enjoy the rest of the evening and what surprised me was just how quickly this thing came came um came about because um, i was planning on doing on finishing the first draft of the book those those four months then coming back to new york and then doing sort of revisions and, and then uh, uh, try to keep the deadline uh, imposed by the editor. Uh, well, this was A, the first time that I actually delivered a manuscript before the deadline. <laughs> My editor was kind of surprised, <laughs> but you know, he was yeah. happy. But not only that, uh, I actually finished writing the first draft of the manuscript in a uh, little more than a couple of months. And the reason for that, I think, is because uh, the topic spoke so much to me, and it was mm. also it had been sort of um, uh, accumulating things and been accumulating in my mind and, and sort of and, and being turned over one way and another. That when I started, it came out as a fl as a flood, basically. I mean, then I started having to go back still and edit it, and and then there were several rounds of editing, of course, because you you never do you never done with the first draft, obviously. But uh, but I was surprised. Uh, th this was actually an amazing experience in, in that sense. Uh, one of the things that you know I encountered is is that so this is you know it's dealing with some some fairly esoteric ideas and some complicated subjects, and you know, a lot of people are going to pick up the book and you know maybe have some notion of stoicism and and you know, some of the people that came along with it. But I guess I was curious, how did you think about how to deal with that? You know, this is sort of the common, like, the class can only move as fast as your sole right. student <laughs> issue. You know, how, how are you deciding at what level to talk to people about something as complex as this? Right. That's an excellent question. Um, but I have a couple of answers there. First of all, I tend to write books that I wish somebody else had written. Hmm. So I, I put myself in the... I have done that for many years. In fact, since I was a kid, I, I um, my initial my first career was in biology and science, not in not in philosophy. I've been a philosopher actually for only for the last eight years or so. And uh, one of the very early influences on my uh, you know formative years in terms of wanting to be a scientist was a book by Peter Medawar, uh, a British cancer uh, researcher, I think. He was, and he wrote this book called um, Advice to a Young Scientist. And my grandfather, who I mentioned earlier, gave me a copy of this book when I was probably 12 or 13 or something like that. And I read it, and it's like, oh, this is great. And the book, I, I still remember, starts out by saying, this is the kind of book that I wish I had available when mm -hmm. I was beginning, a, beginning as a, as a uh, you know, potential young scientist. So yeah. that's the way I write all my books. It's, it's always about 
you know, would I like to read that kind of book? Uh, would I would I enjoy this this sort of book? Um, so that's the first thing. I always have sort of a, a lay version of myself uh, in mind when I when I when I write, which means which has some advantages and some disadvantages. It means, for instance, that I can't write for kids. Yeah, <laughs> for obvious reasons. I read only one book for kids. That was my very first book. Uh, it's published only in Italian, and I, it did well, but it was very difficult. It was very hard uh, because I don't think that in, in on those lines. So, so that's one of my limitations. But um, but it works for these kind of books. The other thing is, um, yeah, you're right. So there are some ideas that are somewhat difficult, in the, especially because people are, you know, f- as you were saying, maybe we're, we're going to talk about this in a minute, uh, that lots of people have preconceived ideas about stories and that actually don't match quite. You know, there's enough truth, in kernel of truth in them to make them dangerous, basically, uh, to, to make you misunderstand the thing completely. So I, I was very aware of that but that's one of the things that i like about stoicism and this is this is something that plenty of other people have noticed the ancient stoics apparently relished this idea of presenting their philosophy in somewhat paradoxical ways in ways that are not exactly immediately grabbing they grab you but they grab you in a weird way it's like they hold your attention and they say what the heck is this this guy talking about in fact, even in the, at the time, this was well known. Uh, Cicero, who was not a Stoic, uh, but was sympathetic to uh, Stoic philosophy, wrote uh, you know a series of books called Stoic Paradoxa, you know p- mm. Stoic Stoic paradoxes, um, to sort of comment on on this aspect of the philosophy. What that does is, and maybe we'll we'll explore a couple of these, um, but what that does, I think, is is it precludes the temptation of turning stoicism into a bumper sticker kind of philosophy, hmm. right? So, so one of my favorite examples is that that uh, one of the fundamental precepts of stoicism that we should live according to nature. Now, if you say it like that, what does that what does that mean? You know, the, the first thing probably to modern life, mo- modern people that comes across is like, oh, sh- you mean that I should go naked in the forest and hug trees or something like that? And no, that's nothing like what it means, yeah. right? Uh, does it mean then, you know, the second interpretation typically is, well, does that mean that the Stoics thought that whatever is natural is good? And no, it's not that either because that's a logical fallacy. I mean, there's plenty of things that are natural, but they're not good for you. You know, snake venom. Yeah, snake venom, <laughs> poisonous mushrooms, hurricanes, you know, that's also stuff that yeah. is natural, but it's not good for you. And of course, the Stoics knew that, right? They were not idiots. No, not in fact, not only they were not idiots, but they actually they were actually famous for their uh, advances in logic. Their their logic was much more sophisticated, for instance, than the one that Aristotle uh, is famous for, and it was um, unsurpassed until the late nineteenth century. So clearly, th- this is not possibly what they could mean. What they meant by living according to nature was like you have to ask yourself, what is the best thing that you can say about human nature. Not not anything about human nature, but the best things about human nature. And, said, and they uh, arrived at, at two things fundamentally. They said, well, human beings are at their best, are social animals, sociable animals, and they are capable of rationality. And therefore, to live according to nature means to apply reason to solve social problems, to, to engage in social living. Right. So to, to this, for the Stoics, that's the best thing you could possibly do because that's the best of human nature. Um, but now, as you, as you notice, it took me two or three minutes to explain this. Yeah, thing, right. It's complicated. It, so it doesn't fall but into a, you know it doesn't yeah. doesn't fit on a bumper sticker, and that's I think a good thing. Yeah, and I think that's something that if people understand, they will agree with. I mean, that's just kind of like how can you you know argue with that, which speaks to their their <laughs> brilliant logic, as you said. So yeah, so let's get into stoicism and the book a bit. Um, so it, we've kind of been dancing around it, but but I want to hear your definition of stoicism, and, and then maybe after that, or folding that into um, the disciplines and areas of study that you talk about. Right. So stoicism is, um, as we said earlier, a ancient Greek and Roman philosophy. It started out around 300 BCE uh, with a guy named Zeno of Citium, modern day modern day Cyprus. Uh, it became prominent um, in the Greek world and then in the Roman world, um, so much so that it was practiced by everybody from you know the, the slaves like Epictetus. In fact, Epictetus himself was a slave. He started out his career, his life, <laughs> as, a, as a slave, and then he became a, a free man and eventually uh, one of the most influential teachers, actually, at the time. So everybody from slaves to emperors, you know, like Marcus Aurelius. Um, at... The co- at core, at the core, um, stoicism is about a couple of things. First of all, 
uh, the main goal is to find, to discover, uh, and then to practice the best way to live your life. This is something that Stoicism had in common with a number of other Greek and Roman philosophies. You know, Epicureans were trying to do the same. The uh, Aristotelians were doing the same, et cetera, et cetera. There were a number of competing. In fact, there was a, a fairly large marketplace of ideas, so to speak, in the Hellenistic period. That there were at least a dozen major schools of philosophy, each one sort of vying for um, uh, for convincing people that yeah, this is the way to live your life. Um, a basic at, at its basic, Stoicism says that um, we should live according to nature. So that means, as I just said, that we should apply reason, uh, our most sophisticated faculty, the one that, that separates us from the rest of the animal world most sharply, um, to social living. And, and if you ask why, well, that's bec because we are capable of applying reason and we are social animals. So what else are we going to do? Uh, so so in... in uh, um, it makes perfect sense to me. Now, the way you do that is by, for instance, uh, realizing what it's called, uh, accepting and internalizing what it's called the dichotomy of control. Um, this is really Epictetus' uh, contribution, the way it's normally uh, sort of presented. Although the idea is actually found all the way down, all, all the way back to Zeno, so to the beginning of Stoicism. The dichotomy of control basically is very, very similar. It sounds very, very similar to the uh, Serenity Prayer. Uh, that is used by 12-step organizations today uh, in the, their meetings. The Serenity Prayer is, of course, a Christian origin, and it's pretty recent, actually. It got started in the uh, early 20th century, late 19th century. And um, the idea is, well, look, you want to distinguish things that are up to you, meaning that are under your control, from things that are not up to you, that are not under your control. And what you want to train yourself to do um, is to put all your efforts and time and energy into the first group and uh, forget about the second one, basically. So ignore it. It's not, uh, Epictetus says, this is none of your concern because it's not up to you. Now, this is another one of those things that it opens itself to sort of misunderstanding. They say, wait a minute. The, f the first thing people say is like, no, no, no. There are actually three things, right? three categories of things. There are things that you control completely. There are things that you don't control at all. And then there are things, there's a lot of stuff in between, which is stuff that you control in part that you can influence, but not determine. And once again, uh, the Stoics knew that, obviously. <laughs> so the way they dealt, what they meant what, uh, by, by the economic control is this, like, look, the things that are really under your control are your values, your judgments, and, you know, the way you exercise your reason, essentially. The things that are not your, not under your control are everything that is external: uh, fame, glory, you know, money, uh, companions, friends. Your own body actually is not under your control; uh, it's an external, in a in a sense. And in practice, what that means is that all these other things you can go after, you can you can try to influence, but the way you do that is by separating even there what really is under your control and what is not for instance let's say let's talk about you know your body it's like it seems, seems weird to say that your body is not under your control right after all it is my body it's not yeah. nobody else's body yes true but you could be stricken by a disease at you know a moment's notice uh in fact just today before you came in i was writing one of my stoic advice columns which is to my surprise has become incredibly popular uh it started out almost as a joke and now i get more submissions that i could possibly deal with over the next several months um and this one was a difficult one because the woman that wrote uh to me is uh, has terminal cancer so you know what do you say what kind of advice do you give to, to somebody in, in th that condition so this can happen to anybody right and that's definitely not it's not under your control i mean you could say well but i can do things like you know, a healthy engage in a healthy lifestyle, not smoke, et cetera, et cetera, and so to diminish the chances that, yes, that's true, but it could still happen. And if it's not cancer, it's somebody and something else. Not only that, but even more mundane things. Like, you know, I go to the gym on a regular basis because I try to keep as much in shape as possible. Um, but the outcome of that, it's not up to me in the sense that I can do my best, I can make the decision. My judgment is, and that's up to me, my judgment is, yes, you if you go to a gym, you're more likely to, uh, you know, stay healthy longer. But the actual result depends on the genetic makeup that I came with, which is definitely not up to me. 
you know, certain people are just have naturally more healthy, more strong bodies than others, or they respond to exercise better or, or to diet better. Uh, well, my genetic makeup wasn't up to me. Um, I got what I got. Um, also, there are other constraints that I cannot influence, right? So there's, there's, there's a number of things. An accident could happen at the gym, so I go with my best intentions, and then all of a sudden something happens and I injure myself, that sort of stuff. So the Stoics th thought, look, what you do in those kind of situations, which cover really pretty much almost anything that happens to us, almost anything that is important to us, you divide up the, the problem into these two components. What is it that is up to you? Well, up to me is the decision to go to the gym and to do my best to you know, go engage in a, in, a, in a good exercise regime and so on and so forth. What is not up to me is everything else, including the outcome. So I'm always going to be happy if it is sad because I can always succeed at the first part because the first part is entirely up to me. If I don't go to a gym, it's my fault. Right? Uh, it is my decision. Uh, it, is, it is my doing. But once I decide to go and I do the best that I can do, um, then the outcome is not up to me and I just accept it for whatever it is with equanimity. equanimity the Stoics were big about equanimity. Right? They said that's the way to get through life in a sort of serene uh, and constructive fashion is to develop equanimity about everything that is external to you, everything that you cannot control. Now, once you start thinking in that way, uh, it applies to everything. You are going out for a promotion at your job, for instance. Uh, well, the promotion is not up to you. The, what is up to you is to put together the best resume you can, to work as hard as you can to actually deserve that promotion, and so on and so forth, right? But the, the, the ultimate outcome is up to your boss and what he thinks of you and maybe your competitors and, you know, maybe the, the, the policy of the company in general, and there's all sorts of other stuff, right? Um, or simpler things, like I like to go, in, go into the movies, and I used to be really annoyed when somebody in, uh, um, predictably would pull out their cell phones in the middle of the movie theater and, you know, and get in the way of, en of the enjoyment, my enjoyment, and as well as other people's enjoyment of the movie. And you can count on it. Somebody's going to do it. Right? It's, it's always. It's, it's yeah. Almost always it's gonna, somebody's going to do it. Now, I used to get really upset and kind of ruin my experience, right? Sometimes I would go up to the person and I would ask politely to, you know, please don't do that. Sometimes that works, and other times you just get a shouting match back, or you know somebody gets upset and says, you know, that's none of your business, you know, that sort of stuff. So what are you going to do? Well, Epictetus would say, what you do is when you get out of the house, uh, you remind yourself that there are two things that you want to do today. One is to go to the movies and enjoy. The other one is to be in harmony with nature, as he put it, which is a poetic way to say basically in uh, in control of your uh, of your. Of, of the situation on your internal re reactions, right? So you go to the to the movies, and then something like that happens. Well, that ruined the first part, but not the second one because mm -hmm. the second one is up to you, right? So you can you can say, okay, well, this guy just doesn't get that he's not in his living room and he doesn't care enough about other people. So what? You know, it could be worse. Something much worse could happen. I'm going to try to enjoy the movie as much as I can, and next time I'm just going to either stay home or do something else. Fede Pictetus has a very, very similar example in uh, in the discourses where instead of going to the movies and dealing with people's uh, cell phones, he says, you know, today I went to the baths, which is something that, of course, the Romans did on a regular basis. And he says, ah, my intention was to go to the baths and have a good time. But, of course, uh, there's always somebody who's going to splash you. There's probably somebody <laughs> who's going to you know, talk loudly. <laughs> yeah. it's, so it's the same situation. It's the same thing. 2,000 yeah. years ago, but it's the same situation. Human beings are the same ev everywhere and all, at all times, which is why I think stoicism is still relevant, right? Because one could ask reasonably, it's like, wait a minute, this, this is a philosophy that was, that was uh, thought out 2,000 years ago, more than 2,000 years ago. What could they possibly be telling us that it's still relevant? And the answer to that is, well, we have changed in terms of technology and uh, uh, you know lifestyle and all that, but basically human beings are essentially the same kind yeah. of people that we were two thousand years ago. Human nature, yes, human is, nature hasn't is changed forever the same. Yep. Yeah, that's why that works. You mentioned physics and how that included sort of our our notion of of science as well as metaphysics. So I want and you talked about religion, uh, religion and God a bit, and I kind of want to briefly get into that and. And you mentioned how many Stoics didn't really believe in anything at all similar to our kind of modern monotheistic conception of God. Right. And uh, and you mentioned the term logos. So how how did that how did the Stoics' view of God differ, and 
Uh, is there anything we can learn from that when we're thinking about religion? Yeah, I think there is a lot actually to learn. One of, one of the reasons uh, I like Stoicism is because I think of modern Stoicism especially as a very ecumenical sort of philosophy. It, um, you can be an atheist or an agnostic uh, and be, be a good Stoic. You can also be a Christian. Uh, you can be uh, a Buddhist actually for, 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 for that matter. Uh, it almost doesn't matter which kind of metaphysics uh, you subscribe to. I say almost because if you are, uh, if you subscribe to a more fundamentalist interpretation of some of the, let's say, Judeo-Christian uh, traditions, then there is no way for you to be a, a stoic because you already have a very specific, um, you know, sort of set of beliefs. But large, broadly speaking, the concept of the logos is actually flexible enough that it can accommodate a number of of metaphysical positions but let me start first by telling, uh, saying about something about what the ancient stoics believed so by modern standards they would be considered pantheistic um, a pantheist is somebody who thinks that god is the universe god is immanent in the universe he's everywhere so it's not really a he uh, uh, it's it's a you, pantheists think of the whole universe as a sort of a living organism essentially of which we are parts um it's a very it's a bit i mean i don't believe it but it's a beautiful um philosophy i think because uh, one of the things that it tells you for instance is that uh since you are part you're literally part of god right you're literally a, a bit in fact you're one of the as epictetus says you're one of the most important b parts because a lot of the parts like a stone for instance don't think don't react don't feel don't do anything they're just there they're still also part of the universe and they're part of god technically speaking but the really interesting parts are us right um, and because you're a part, things will happen to you that might not make sense to you, right? Just like uh, one of these examples, uh, uh, which I think, it, again, it's, it's really nice. It's a really interesting use of, of a metaphor. It says, look, imagine that uh, you're not you, you're just your foot, and your foot is about to step into the mud because you're directing it to step into the mud because you have to go you know, home and there's some mud before you get home. Well, the f your foot is not going to like it, right? But but that's only because it doesn't realize that it's connected to a body, and it's mm. it's the body that needs to get home, and it's for the good of the body that things happen, not not the good of the of the foot. Now this sounds a lot like Christian providence, right? It's like this idea, you know, uh, Christians often, when faced with problems of evil, uh, they will say, "Well, this is God's plan." But it's actually significant. I mean, it's compatible with that. If you're a Christian, you want to be practicing stoicism. That's the way you're gonna you're gonna interpret it. But I think it can be interpreted in a number of other ways. Uh, one of which is no, no. There's no plan. It's just that because the universe is an organism, it will do whatever it's good for it, and not for its parts. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's no overall plan. It's just that you know the universe does what the universe does, and and you're a part of it, and you're sort of in there. You're 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 part of a, a greater whole. Uh, of, of so it's, it's not control. always to be understood. It's right. You can't understand it uh, always. I mean, Epictetus says you know you, we can understand much more than anybody else, than any other animal, than certain than plants and, and rocks. But even so, there is a limited amount of understanding. So that's what the Stoics, the ancient Stoics thought. But the word the, the word that they used was logos, which actually is older than the Stoic philosophy. It actually goes back all the way to Heraclitus, uh, who was a big influence uh, on the Stoics, one of the pre-Socratic uh, philosophers. Um, and the logos can be interpreted in a number of ways. M at the most broad level of interpretation is simply the idea that the universe is structured in a rational way right now again if you're a christian you can take that and say yeah the logos the word it means word in greek right and sure enough uh genesis starts with in the beginning was the word right hmm. and so you can say okay so the logos is in fact god and that's one interpretation if you're uh uh uh, pantheist, you could say, no, no, the Logos is actually the embodiment of God in the entire universe. If you're an atheist, you say, the Logos is the observable fact that the universe is organized according to rational principles. If it wasn't, then we wouldn't have science. I mean, science is predicated on the fact that we can rationally understand the universe. But in order to rationally understand something, that something has to be organized rationally. It has doesn't to mean follow there is a, some rules. Right. It has to follow some rules. It doesn't mean there is an organizer. It doesn't mean that there is somebody who planned it that way, right? But it has to be organized according to some rules. Otherwise, you wouldn't understand. Otherwise, things would just happen at random and without no, no, no rhyme and reason. That's why this kind of God is often referred to as Spinoza's God, because Spinoza was one of the modern, early modern philosophers, actually, who um, 
was strongly influenced by the Stoics, and then also later on by as Einstein's God. Einstein was famously asked, you know, do, do you believe in God? And he said, yeah, God is the laws of nature. Hmm. He didn't say he made up the laws of nature or he created the laws of nature. He said God is the laws of nature. So that sounds to me really, really close to the Stoic position. And hmm. as an atheist, I can live with it. So you talk a little bit about uh, character and how important it is to to judge character. And uh, you acknowledge it can be difficult if we haven't met that person right. to kind of judge them beforehand. But y you write a little bit about how maybe modern media is a way of doing that and in, in many forms. For instance, people that read your book are going to have some, some judgment about your character based on right. what they read. Uh, just like if we see an interview of, you know, some famous basketball player on TV, we might try and make some assessment of their character. Or we might hear a new story or something. So, yeah, we're constantly kind of doing this. But I wanted to push back a little bit and and ask, you know, to what extent you think that that's consistent of their actual character? And is it fair for us to be using media as a proxy for understanding people right now that's an excellent question so uh, there's a couple of answers there first of all every theater says that one of the things that we should not do is to judge people um uh, there's a number of places in the in the discourses and in the uh, in the manual where he says things like uh don't say that somebody uh drinks too much just say that he drinks a lot because mm. saying that somebody drinks a lot means it's a, it's a, it's a statement, it's an observation, right? Oh, the guy's eating a lot, drinking a lot, you know, more than I could do. Uh, if you say too much, uh, now you're imposing a judgment. Now, now you're saying that, that he's doing actually something wrong. And now and Epitaph says, how do you know that? You don't know enough about that person. You don't know enough about his motivations. You don't know what brought him to drink. You don't know if he can take that drinking or not. And you, you, you don't really know a lot about it. So you should probably try to f rephrase things in a sort of a third person objective way, in a descriptive way as opposed to a judgmental way. So, uh, and m another one of the things that I, that I love about Epictetus is that it says, it tells you, it's, it tells you what kind of things you should and should not talk about with uh, friends or in company, social company. And he says, you know, don't talk about uh, things like, you know, unimportant things like gladiators and horse races. Of course, we don't have gladiators today, but basically it means sports and, you know, things that are little consequences. I didn't talk about it as little as possible because they're not really that interesting. But whatever you do, don't gossip. Hmm. Don't talk about other people that are not there and judging them. Because that's really the for a stoic, that's one of the worst things you can do in in a, in a social setting. Because you're violating almost all of the uh, of the of the of the stoic virtues. You're making a judgment uh, in a way that the person cannot defend themselves, and also probably on the basis of information that is only partial or incomplete or possibly incorrect. So you're absolutely right. We shouldn't judge people solely on the basis of you know, what is represented in the media. For instance, you mentioned my book. Well, obviously I'm the author, so I put certain certain view of myself out there, right? So a p person is going to be in much better shape of sort of in terms of judging my character if they know me personally or if they have access to information about my behavior, not just what I write, right? Now, there the, the media often do help, right? So there are, if we're talking about politicians, because that came out in the context of politics, you know, so uh, there is a... Uh, you know how do you how you decide whether to vote for a for a candidate uh, or not? Uh, well, in part, of course, you want to you want to pay attention to the ideas being expressed and to the program and all and all that. But you know that that's going to change. I mean, it, you know, you know, it's not just that people are flip floppers and and they or they pull a fast one on you and they promise uh, something and then they do something completely different. That happens too, unfortunately, in a, a distressfully high frequency. But it's also the nature of politics. I mean, right? So you you. You, pr you have certain ideas, you have certain ideals informing your program. But then when you go there, you have to deal with the fact that there is an opposition. There is, you know, there is other parties. There are other people with different ideas. So you have to compromise. So you cannot, I don't think it's fair to hold the politician to the letter of what he says or she says during a, a campaign because it's just not possible. Then what do you do? Well, you want to agree, of course, on the general directions or on the general ideas, but you also want to make sure as much as it is possible to do indirectly that this is a person of integrity. This is a person that will, in fact, honestly try to do what he's saying trying to that, that he will do. Whether he will succeed or not, again, this is the dichotomy of control, right? Whether he succeeds or not, it's, that's how it is control. 
It's not just up to him, to him. but to try his best is in fact up to him, right? Mm. Now, <coughs> excuse me, I don't think you can judge a, in a positive fashion necessarily a, someone else's character just by media appearances. But it's not that difficult to find the faults and, and, and the alarm bells. You know, when somebody in, on media appearances keeps behaving in a way that it's not appropriate, you know, bullying other people, for instance, or things like that, or lying about things, well, that any, that's an indication of a bad character. And so I, uh, my alarm bells go off at that, at that point, right? So I don't need, I can start with the assumption that the person is a good person and is an honest person, but then I watch what he actually does and what he actually says, and that might give me some clue. But more importantly, the issue here of character is that st so stoicism shouldn't be used as a, a, a stick to beat other people on the head and say, you know, bad stoic mm. uh, kind of thing. Stoic I stoicism is about self-improvement, not not going around telling other people what to do or what not to do, right? Now, if other people ask you, and uh, fine, then, then you tell them, I say, well, here's what I do and here's why I do it, right? But it's really about self-improvement. It's really about um, talking to yourself, reflecting, being mindful of what you are doing and are you holding up to your own ideals and expectations and things like that? And if not, what can you do to, Im to improve that sort of thing, right? Um, and one way to do that is this idea of picking a role model, right? And uh, so a friend of mine and I called this, the, uh, this uh, exercise, this is one of the spiritual exercises actually that I suggest at the end of the book, and we call it the sage on the shoulder. The sage is this ideal, uh, the ideally wise person, right, that you want. On, on, and the, and the, the, the idea is, is that you, you keep him on your shoulders so he's always watching over what you're doing. Um, and constantly you, s you ask yourself, well, what would... Socrates do if if Socrates is your hmm. role model. This, of course, is not a um, uh, an idea that is restricted to Stoicism, right? So lots of modern Christians go around with bracelets that say WWJD, right? So what right. would Jesus do, right? That's the same idea. Not only that, but social science, uh, social psychology research actually shows that if people are reminded that somebody can maybe watching over them, even somebody who doesn't exist, so an ideal, uh, uh, so imaginary figure, they will actually behave better. Yeah, I've seen, I actually saw research where they placed like a, a photo of a pair of eyes mm -hmm. in a store or something that mm -hmm. caused like theft to drop. Right. Something exactly. like that. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah. So human beings are just like that. They're <laughs> it's very easy. Now, and now, often when I say things like that, people say, oh, but that's just a mind trick. Mm. And, and my response is, what do you mean just? Yeah, it's uh, all mind this tricks. Is all, it's this all is mind tricks. Yeah, right? This is what we're doing. <laughs> this is what we're doing. And, and Stoics were very good at mind tricks. Uh, now, the, the, the important thing about mind tricks is, a, of course, that you want them to be efficacious, you want them to work, but B, you want them to do in the right for the right reasons. And that's, I think, why that, that's a major difference between a philosophy of life like Stoicism or others, you know, Buddhism, I think, is a, another philosophy of life. Um, that's a difference between a philosophy of life and an actual trick or an actual thing that you do just for, you know, for, for very limited reasons and for limi very limited applications. So you talk a little bit about something called the banality of evil. Right. And I thought this was very interesting. And, and you write about how people might not understand, uh, people that are doing wrong might not understand that they're actually hurting themselves. And so I wanted to ask you about the difference between evil and ignorance and how we should reflect on that difference as we kind of go through our lives. Yeah, I think that's that's a very important concept. Um, it's, it's one of the most important uh, stoic concepts, but it's not found, again, just in stoicism. So the, the phrase, the banality of evil, is actually very recent. It comes from uh, philosopher Anna Arendt, uh, who covered the Heichmann uh, trial in Jerusalem uh, back in the 60s. And uh, she went there. She was she was covering this for the New Yorker. What was the trial? Maybe just uh, for people. Oh, this was uh, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, this was uh, the trial of a fairly high level uh, Nazi officer who was uh, arrested. Well, actually kidnapped technically in Argentina, where he where he was living his life after World War II, uh, brought back to is Israel and put up for for trial. And uh, Heichmann was basically one of the people in charge of the logistics of the final solution. So he actually literally organized the trains to move people to concentration camps, things like that. When uh, So the New Yorker asked Arendt, who I, I think was a um, philosophy faculty, a teacher at uh, the New School here in New York, 
and uh, they asked him to go to Jerusalem and sort of cover the trial. And when she went, she was expecting what everybody would expect, like, you know, an evil person with, you know, sort of a personified evil uh, sort of situation where this guy was re- was going to be really awful and, and really clearly so deviant that it's like um, not even interesting, really. And what she found instead was a perfectly normal person who was concerned about his wife and his family and his friends and so on and so on. And he thought it was just doing a job. Right, um, and so the phrase "the banality of evil" w- uh, was meant to reflect this idea that often what we call evil, it's actually a lack of consciousness, a lack of paying attention uh, to what people are doing. Another uh, important ma- modern philosopher, Thomas Nagel, who is at uh, NYU and New York University, wrote a famous paper uh, a number of years ago uh, called a "Moral Luck." Where he says, you know, be careful when you are so quick at say at condemning, you know, the entire German nation, for instance, for allowing, you know, something like Nazism to happen, or in uh, uh, the, the Italian nation to, to allow fascism or things like that. He says, you know, that's you. You feel that you're so morally superior just because you didn't live there. You, you, it's easy for you. You're uh, you're outside. Mm-hmm. You, you you're lucky enough. You don't have to actually experience that sort of situation. Now, of course. This may be about to change in the United States right now, given the current political climate. But you know, now now we're facing actually a situation which I don't think is quite as terrible, but it's problematic from an from an ethical perspective. And we'll see how people actually will react uh, over the next few years. But the basic idea is that most of the time, you know, most people just do things because that's the thing to do within that society, and they just don't question it. They don't pay attention. Now the Stoics brought that uh, even a step further. And they took that actually straight from Socrates. Um, uh, They had their own elaboration, but this is a Socratic idea. So Socrates is often uh, quoted as saying that uh, people don't do evil, they're just ignorant. And if you read that quote, as I did a number of times, it 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 pops up in several Platonic dialogues. If you read it, you know, face value, you say, what the hell is he talking about? Of course people are not ignorant. I mean, people... What do you mean by ignorant? Did, did they not go to college or something? No, we know plenty of people who are educated and still do evil things, right? So how can he possibly be? Now, I, I warn my students that any time that they read something by a famous philosopher and their reaction is, this is, this is clearly stupid, uh, that probably is a good indication that they didn't understand what actually the philosopher mm. was, was, yeah. was talking about. If right? it's made it all the way to now, <laughs> yeah, it's probably exactly. got some it's wisdom. It's 2,400 years. So it's like, you yeah. know, people have thought about this stuff. So I went back and I asked the call. I mentioned earlier that I'm not a uh, ancient philosophy scholar. So I went and to one of my colleagues at City College, uh, uh, Nick Pappas, who is actually a brilliant um, uh, ancient philosophy scholar, meaning that he's a scholar of ancient philosophy. He's not that old. And um, and I asked uh, help. I said, you know, what what's the word that Plato is using there to describe what Socrates is saying? What, what's the exact word and what does that say? And that's why there is a chap- entire chapter on that word in the in in the book. Um, the word is amatia, A-M-A-T-H-I-A. And it means literally unwisdom. Mm. So it's not ignorance. It's lack of wisdom. right? And this word comes up uh, especially in a dialogue in which Socrates is talking to Alcibiades. Alcibiades uh, was a famous and very influential Athenian general. He also happened to be Socrates' student as well as Socrates' lover, incidentally. And so there's this really wonderful dialogue between the two of them. And at some point, Socrates says to Alcibiades, you know, look, my friend, your problem is that you suffer from amatia. You are unwise. And with you, a lot of your class, meaning a lot of other politicians, do that. And that is why it's, you know, you guys are going to ruin this place. Because it's not that you're not smart. Alcibiades was a very smart person. It's not that he wasn't courageous. He was a very brave person. It's not that he wasn't educated. He, his his uh, mentor was um, um, one of the most famous Athenian orators of the time. So it's like, that's not what was missing. What was missing was wisdom. What was missing was the understanding of, of what is right and what is wrong. The understanding of how you should behave properly in, uh, in life and, and in society. And I think the reason I like that word is because it does two things. First, it reminds me, at least, that it's, it's good to be as charitable as possible toward other people. To think that even somebody does something horrible, 
they don't do it because they really want to do something horrible. Nobody gets up in the morning and goes to the mirror and says, what kind of evil can I do today? They all, they all think that they're doing the right thing. They either, either there is some disease going on, you know, some, what is it, a sociopath or a psychopath, you know, so it's something actually mentally going on there. Or they really are under the impression that they're doing the right thing for whatever the circumstances are and for whatever reason. So they're misguided. They're not, they're not really evil. If you start thinking along those lines, then you become much more chatterable toward people. You become much more understanding. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't oppose, oppose them. Um, and it doesn't mean you shouldn't restrain them uh, if the case uh, may be, and if, if that's necessary. Um, it just means that you shouldn't um, engage in sort of uh, revenge or, or, in, or in, in thoughts of sort of dehumanize the other person, the other the other individual, because he's doing something that it's that it's evil. Mm-hmm. Evil is a strange category. It's it's a, you know ontologically speaking, so metaphysically speaking, it's a strange thing. It's like what do you mean by evil it's not it's not something out there it's something that comes from a human character and so it's a flaw in human character and as if you're understanding as such then you say ah well you should pity uh, Petita says over and over you should pity those people you shouldn't be angry with them hmm. so speaking of anger you have a chapter that deals with anger anxiety and loneliness so i'm curious to hear some of the stoic suggestions on how to deal with those three things and how they might be similar or different to what the American Psych- Psychology Association suggests, um, and maybe even in a, a time that you use one of those, if you've got a story. Yeah. So the Stoic techniques, the Stoic, Stoics uh, spent a lot of time talking about anger. Um, before actually we get into anger, that this gives me a, a chance to talk about, or not t- uh, for a second, about one of the common misunderstandings about stoicism. Lots of people think that stoicism is about suppressing your emotions, right? So going around life with, with as Mr. Spock from Star Trek. Mm, that's not the case, but as I said earlier, there is a kernel of truth there. Uh, the Stoics made a distinction between passions and emotions. They had two different words. Again, in order, you know, w- what was enlightening to me was to actually go back to the original Greek and say, ah, they are using two different words. Mm. And the word for passion was actually pathos, which is the same root as pathology, hmm. right? And so it's a disease. So they thought that n- that negative, destructive emotions, things like fear, hatred, uh, anger, those are destructive, emo- destructive emotions. You don't want them. Uh, so those, yes, you do want to control. You want to stay away as much as possible for, for, for from those. But then there is the positive emotions, for which they had a completely different word, eupatei, and uh, those include love and concern for other people and friendship, you know, uh, cult- uh, cultivating friendship. All of those are positive emotions, and actually they thought that you should nurture those. In fact, the Stoics referred to their philo- described their philosophy as a philosophy of love, which mm. comes as a surprise to people that, so like, what do you mean? Okay, so now back to anger. Mm. Uh, Anger was in particular one of those emotions that negative emotions and negative passions that they concentrate a lot. I mean, uh, um, Seneca wrote an entire book on anger, and actually, it's a perfectly nice analysis. Both it's both a philosophical and a psychological analysis of the phenomenon of anger, but it's also a manual in anger management. You mentioned the APA, uh, the American Phil- um, uh, Psychological Association. Actually, it's more than one APA, but there's also the American Philosophical Association, mm. but. But the, the psychology APA uh, does have a section on their website about anger management. And, you know, like two-thirds or more of the techniques and the, and the comments you find there are, are essentially what you find in Seneca. Hmm. I'm not saying that they took them from Seneca. Uh, they are, you know, the modern version, of course, is evidence-based and it's, it's based on research and so on and so forth. But basically, it's the same thing. One of the, f- one of the reasons, I think, the Stoics in particular, but also other ancient philosophers, especially Aristotle, are still valuable today is because they were very good observers of human nature. They paid attention. In fact, one of the most uh, important Stoics that most people have never heard of is Posidonius. Posidonius uh, lived before Epictetus. He was uh, sort of in the middle period of the, of the history of Stoicism in the, like, the, s- the first century before uh, the current era. And Posidonius wrote books and books and books on human psychology, he, he, and in particular on the emotions. Mm. Uh, he, w- he traveled the world on purpose to collect observations, information about how people react to different situations. So it was actually very empirically minded. It was a sort of a uh, psychologist ante literum. Now, back to anger. Seneca thought uh, that anger is essentially temporary madness. 
And that's the way he put it. And so he disagreed with Aristotle. Aristotle thought that uh, we should always aim for the sort of middle ground so that there can be a, you know, a middle level anger, which is good because it motivates you to do things, it motivates to react to injustice and things like that, right? But, um, but uh, Seneca's point was like, no, <laughs> anger is a disease. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pathos. And there's not just thing as a good, good disease. Um, it's, what it is, is, and in fact, he said, you don't need anger. What you want to cultivate is uh, something that we would today probably call a, a sense of righteous, uh, you know, uh, uh, of justice, a sense indignation. of indignation, yeah. right? That is the kind of thing that motivates you. And that's a positive emotion, according to the Stoics. But if you go around reacting to things while you're angry, you're very likely going to regret it. Even if your anger is actually justified, even if there is something that, you know, there was an injustice and you react to it with anger, you're probably going to react in the wrong way. You're going to probably either overreact or rush into something um, that it's not. In fact, one of, so I have two examples. One is ancient and the other one is modern. I, I taught a, a course on Stoicism at City College last year, an undergraduate course. And one of the things that I showed them, uh, my students, was uh, uh, the beginning scene in the movie Gladiator. Gladiator is an interesting movie because, with, you know, Russell Crowe, uh, because it's actually fairly historically accurate. It's not, not entirely, but it's, you know, f it's pretty close. Lots of the stuff that actually happened there, it's, it's true. And one of the characters you see in the beginning is Marcus Aurelius. Uh, who is, you know, at the time was dying, I said, was very old and was, it was dying. What is not true is what's shown in the movie that he was killed by his, by his son. He, he probably died of natural causes. But um, nonetheless, there is this initial scene, this, is this initial battle scene between the Romans and the Marcomanni, who were one of the German tribes who were trying to sort of uh, penetrate inside the Roman frontier. And this actually happened. That, that battle actually happened. And I told my student to pay attention to what was going on because the Marcomanni probably had good reasons to be angry at the, at the Romans. And, they, and it shows in the, in, the, in the way they fought, right? They, they, they just catapulted themselves. You know, they just went out uh, screaming and yelling and, and, and in a very courageous sort of manner, just threw themselves at the Roman legions. Now, you look at it from the other side, the Romans didn't move by an inch. They were ready. They were. They had their shields in, in position, their spears in position, and they w they were fighting for their own reasons. You know, it's not like you know they had their own families and their own uh, things. So, but the the contrast between the two sides couldn't be uh, bigger. You know, more obvious, more evident. And sure enough, the Marcomanni suffered an incredible defeat. It's just that they were completely slaughtered in that thing. What is the point of that? The point is you can have all the right reasons and fight even to the death, you know, risk your life for the right reasons. But if you do it in a rash way, you're probably going to lose your life rather than actually accomplish what, what you're going to do. Now, the mm. modern example is more, I think, uh, it's, it would speak more to, to, um, to our audience. And that is um, of somebody who is not a Stoic, but was um, interestingly, I found out recently, uh, deeply influenced by Stoicism. That's uh, Nelson Mandela. Hmm. So Mandela was very, very, a very angry person when he was thrown in prison uh, during the apartheid regime. And you would think, right? I mean, it's not just what they personally did to him, uh, but to his people in general. The problem is that he, at some point during his imprisonment, he started realizing that you know, the anger wasn't getting him anywhere. That being angry and, and so sort of dehumanizing his, his opponents, uh, you know, the, not only the leaders of the apartheid regime, but also his, his guards, was simply not getting him anywhere. He was simply eating himself up with this thing, not going anywhere. One of his fellow inmates uh, smuggled in a copy of Marcus Aurelius' Meditations into the prison, and several people read it, including uh, Mandela. And, and, and Mandela said that that was one of the things that helped him work through his anger. Hmm. And the turning point came when he was finally able to overcome his anger, which, again, was highly justified. Um, and and started reaching out. He actually became a friend with his torturer. And he started saying things like, well, this guy's just doing his job. He doesn't have anything personal against me. He's, he's doing his job. He's thinking that he's doing, because of the way he grew up, because of the way his character has been molded since he was uh, you know, young or a child, he just thinks he's doing the right thing. He's just it's the banality of evil. It's the banality yeah. of evil, exactly. Yeah. Once he did that, once he realized that, he actually started reaching out and they became friends. 
right? Um, and that l led him then eventually down to the path of sort of reconciliation as opposed to open conflict and so on and so forth. And mm. as we know, that worked out. So I think that Seneca has a good point uh, in terms of, you know, be careful about, about indulging in anger. In terms of practical stuff, uh, Seneca sounds very fam uh, very very modern, uh, and so do some of the other Stoics. So, so one of the other Stoics, for instance, uh, told the emperor at some point, um, I forgot which emperor it was, but said, you know, the next time you're angry at something, because you're the emperor, so the, the anger of the emperor carries consequences, right? You know, so that's, nobody's going to stand up to that sort of thing. So the next time you're angry, just run through the alphabet, all 24 letters of the Greek alphabet, and when you get to the end, Think about it and say, "Are you still hungry?" <laughs> right? And this is a modern technique. This is, you know, the count, the famous count to ten or count to whatever it is. Yeah, it's the same idea. Uh, Seneca says at some point, uh, "You're angry? Great. So disengage. The first thing you do is to put some some distance between you and the object of your anger. Just go out for a walk. You know, and then when you come back, in the meantime, sort of trying to calm yourself down. You know, deep, you know, deep breathing and that sort of stuff. Then when you come back, your your reason is back in charge." Now, you may still have good reasons to act, and you may still have good reasons to so pursue a particular course of action, but you're not doing it under the influence of this temporary madness mm. uh, that he was talking about. Now you're doing it rationally. So what you, talk, you talk about love and, and friendships and relationships towards the end of the book, and I found it really interesting that, that there were so many kinds of love, and this is and the way that, that uh, um, Stoics thought about this. So maybe talk a little bit about the the four different, I think there were four different kinds of love and then how that can be useful for us to think about our friendships and relationships. Yeah. That's another one of those situations where, uh, unfortunately, I think uh, us moderns have lost something in translation or, or the, during the uh, passage of time. So the, the Greeks actually had five different words uh, uh. to indicate different types of love. And... Um, when I found that out, this was not recent. recently, I found it out a few years ago, and it struck me as like, yeah, exactly. Um, I, feel I feel very strange, even as an Italian, because in Italian there is more than one word to express the English word love. Uh, but in English, it's love for all sorts of things. So, so I'm supposed to love my country, to love my daughter, to love my partner, uh, to love my friends, uh, to love philosophy. Or my. It's like, wait a minute, but surely those are not the same kind of things yeah. right and sh in fact the stoic the not only the stoics but the greeks in general had different words for these things that i just mentioned that they they referred to them now they saw them as related because they they did perceive just like the english word uh the fact in english we use a single word we do perceive that there is a, some commonality among these things in all of these it means that there is some positive emotional attachment to a particular person or idea or, or whatever it is right but we also but the, the Greeks also said, yes, thought that, yes, but wait a minute, those are different, and they need to be distinguished, so we need mm -hmm. different words uh, for these things. What we can learn from that, I think, is that is, is to think about those different kinds of relations that we have with both people and ideas more carefully. Again, one of the fundamental ideas of Stoicism is mindfulness. And by mindfulness, what the Stoics meant was literally paying attention. Right, so to, to be mindful as a stoic means that you're actually paying attention to what you're doing and why you're doing it. So, using different words to refer to related and yet distinct sort of emotional reactions help you being mindful about the fact that you don't want to confuse those things. You don't want to mm. think of all of that stuff as one big mush. Um, and also, it might help you think that perhaps some of those are not appropriate. Per perhaps, perhaps you shouldn't be you know, loving whatever it is, um, uh, an idea, for instance, uh, in the same way or, or even more probably than you love a, a person, that you should make a distinction between the, intens you know, the intensity of your emotions and you should say, well, you know, are my emotions actually proportioned to the worth of this idea or of this, this person, right? Uh, let's take friendship, for instance. So Seneca wrote a lot about friendship as well. And um, he said something very interesting in, about friends. He said, um, be very, very careful before you admit somebody in the number of your friends. Mm. Right? Be, uh, scrutinize him, you know, so, so basically almost giving an exam to his character, basically. But once you've done that, trust him completely. 
It's just like once it's inside, once you said, okay, this is this is a person that I can call a friend, uh, then your internal attitude should change completely because because now because you want to to have your friend, as Aristotle, who was not a Stoic, put it, uh, your friend should be a mirror to your soul. Uh, mm. It should yeah. be somebody that. If the case is, uh, uh, you know, if it is required, if it is called for, then it should actually be able to confront you and say, "Look, what you're doing is not right," or "You're not thinking straight about this, this sort of thing." That's a real friend. So it's funny today that we have, you know, we're on social networks and we have hundreds or thousands of friends. And I keep telling whoever asks me that that's simply not possible. I mean, you can call them friends, <laughs> right? <laughs> you can use it. again. That's a that's a that's a misuse of a word. Right? Uh, they're certainly acquaintances. They're people you're in contact with. You call them whatever you want, but they're not your friends. In fact, for Aristotle um, and for the Stoics, you could have only a very few friends in your life because a friendship actually requires a lot of energy and time and commitment. Right? Now, you can have most of us, not all of us, but most of us have only one partner, you know, uh, uh, close partner at a time. And there are some people who engage in polyamory and things like that. But most of us um, have just one. Why is that? Um, you could say, well, that's because you know, sort of, uh, society imposes a certain uh, a certain way of thinking about it, especially Judeo-Christian society and all that that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's true. But think about it. One of the reasons I was personally never particularly interested in polyamory is because it's hard enough to to have a good relationship and a quality relationship with one person, let alone with three or four or five. Yeah, and it's like it gets really out of you know out of control very quickly. <laughs> Uh, because people are complicated, because it, it requires a lot of time, because you have to mend things when things don't go well, you know, and so, and so on and so forth. Now, a friend is very close to that kind of position. You know, a friend no, is not quite your partner, but almost, right? You know, usually you don't have sex with your friends. Um, but other than that, it's a fairly close per a, a person. You can call a friend with a sort of capital F is a very close person. So w that means you, you see each other often. That means you pay attention to each other. You help each other. And, so, and you know, there's only 24 hours in a day. And we spend a third of those sleeping. So <laughs> And then working. And, and then working yeah. and then doing <laughs> all sorts of other things, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's why I, I think that the... Um, the ancient Greek way and Roman uh, way of thinking about love, friendship, and and how they're related is much more nuanced and and sophisticated than our own, and we can learn a thing or two uh, from sort of going back to that sort of way of thinking. Yeah. So I want to, uh, and we alluded to this earlier, but I want to talk about the the last chapter of the book, and you had these twelve practical spiritual exercises, and I thought that was really helpful and really useful for people. So 12 is a lot, so maybe we won't go into all 12, <laughs> right. but uh, but I would definitely read them all. But maybe talk about a couple of your favorites. Yeah. So we talked about one already, the sage on the shoulder kind of thing, right? Yeah. So pick your role model, and, and uh, a role model can be somebody you know personally, somebody you, you think is a you know, good person. and uh, It doesn't have to be, uh, by the way, a perfect person. There's, there's no such thing, unless it's fictional. Uh, and the Stoics did go for for fictional role models as well. Uh, they thought, you know, they often they, they referred to Odysseus or to Heracles, the demigod, as, uh, as their role model. Um, but more, more often than not, these were either people that you knew personally or people you knew uh, enough about, uh, such as Socrates, that you could use them as, uh, as your role models. So that's a good exercise, I think. And as we said earlier, that's actually helpful, you know, practically helpful. Um, now, one of my favorite exercises and one of the, one th those that I find most uh, uh, effective is the evening diary. So this is something that uh, in a sense, the entire meditations by Marcus Aurelius is a diary. It's a, it's a philosophical diary, right? So this this was the book was not written for publication. Uh, it was his personal diary during that campaign against the Marcomanni that I was talking about. He was he was writing that um, during the years that he was there. Um, in fact, the original title of the meditation was uh, during the Middle Ages, early Middle Ages, was to myself. Hmm. It was not you know. now. Seneca, however, tells you in detail how to do that, how to do the, 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 the diary, the personal diary. And so he says, um, uh, in the evening, you know, before going to bed, uh, uh, you don't want to do it in bed because otherwise you fall asleep. So you, before going to bed, you find a you know, quiet uh, corner in your house or apartment. Um, and he says, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting reading 
uh, a lot of Seneca because you also get a glimpse of his personal life as well as his you know, life in, in the Roman Empire. And he says, you know, my wife knows my habits, so she leaves me alone for a few minutes, you know, before going to bed. And, and what he does was he says, you know, I go over my day and the important things that happen during the day. And I ask myself three questions. The first one is, what did I do wrong? Because you always do something wrong. <laughs> you're, we're human beings. We're, 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 we're fallible. But the point of that is not, he says immediately, is not to beat yourself up. The point of that is to remember and learn so that you're less likely to do it the next time. Regret, the Stoics had no, no place for regret. Mm. Regret was something that it was a waste of emotional energy because by definition, the past is outside of your control. Whatever you did, you did. That's it. Done. Um, the future, however, you can influence. Right? <laughs> you can make a decision right now uh, to sort of not do it again. Uh, so the first thing, that's the first thing you do. And then he says, in fact, once you review that part, sort of forgive yourself. Right? Say, okay, well, whatever I did, it's done. Now I realize that it was not a good thing, so I'm going to try not to do it again. The second question is, what did you do right? Because presumably you also did something right. And he says, it's a good thing to pat yourself on the back and, and remind you that you're actually making progress. Otherwise, it's sort of you become dispirited and you sort of give up. And then the third thing is, what could I have done differently? Right. Because there's always situations, especially in difficult, uh, you know, circumstances. There's always a, uh, uh, you know, this this happened to me a lot of times. It's like you, you go through a situation, and then later on you reflect and you say, oh yeah, I really should have done this, or I should have said this, or I should have acted in this way rather than that way, right? And the idea is that if you do that, if you run through uh, sort of a, in your mind through alternative scenarios about what you could have done. This is going to prepare you for the next time that something like that happens. Human life is not really that varied, after all. You know, situations occur over and over. You, you, find, you know, or very similar situations occur over and over. And so, and and Seneca says, you know, the prepared mind is the one that actually deals best with those kind of situations. And so, the evening diary, I found it very, very. Uh, in, on the one hand, it's soothing. Uh, it's sort of you put to rest your thoughts for the day, and then you prepare for bed and you, you have a good night of sleep uh, but it's also a learning experience about yourself it's about it's it's um it's um sort of a type of mindfulness about yourself so those are two of of the my my favorite exercises uh, a third one is something that i do only once in a while but i find it um sort of really spiritually um uh, invigorating and i say that as an atheist who doesn't really believe in spirits um but if you do believe in spirits that's even better so this is a meditation that is found in marcus uh, and apparently is as old as the Pythagoreans because he says that the Pythagoreans much earlier uh, than Marcus Aurelius were doing this sort of stuff. And the Pythagoreans, of course, were not Stoics. They were before the Stoics. But the Stoics kind of incorporated um, this into their practices. And this is the morning, s uh, the sunrise meditation. Um, uh, he says, you know, at least from time to time, just go outside and look at the sun rising. Just take, you know, 20 minutes, right? Go that right there before... I live on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, so for me it's particularly easy to do that. I just go to the river and, and just, just watch. Just, just stay there for 10 minutes, 15 minutes before it comes up and, sort of and, and, and wait until a few minutes after it has come up. Why would you want to do that? Uh, Marcus says, um, because that reminds you of just how large and beautiful the universe actually is. Um, there's this sense of transcendence, if you, if you will. Uh, you don't have to believe in God in order to feel transcend transcendence. You, you, can, you definitely do if you do believe in God. But even if you don't, even if you're looking just at the laws of nature, right? So nature is it's beautiful. It's terrifying at, at times, but it's beautiful. And so to do that in once in a while, I do it um, maybe w uh, once every month or two, uh, just to especially if I go to a different place. If I go on a vacation or something like that or, uh, or, a, or a trip somewhere, then I, I make a point of, making, of doing the sunrise meditation. And it's, it, it's another moment of sort of quiet where you are with yourself, but you're also with nature. And especially today with this, you know, um, very frantic life that we live, we don't take the time to do that sort of thing, right? Um, uh, when I was a kid, I was interested in astronomy, but I was growing up in Rome. It's Rome is not exa exactly a great place to look at the stars. And New York is much worse. You know, and, and there's night after night when I look up and there's no star uh, or almost no nothing to look at. But the sun is always there. The sun is going to be there, and it's a good thing to remind yourself uh, that there is that kind of, you know, big, powerful nature, and that you're a pretty small part of it.
Yeah, I was that, that's I was about to say I'm not as much a morning person. So yeah, if you can find a way out of the city, which I like to do, and then you in the middle of the night you can look up and right. just be yeah. blown away. I, I remember I was in Indonesia once in like this little small island, and it was just you could see the entire night sky, all the stars everywhere, and it was a very similar transcendent experience where you felt really connected. Right. So yeah, I can attest to that one. All right, so why don't we wrap it up? I like to do a little thunder round, a couple quick questions, and then we'll call it a day. Sure. Sound good? All right. So what is your favorite food or drink? <laughs> I'm Italian. My favorite food is pasta. Pasta. <laughs> I should have known. Uh, of course, that doesn't really tell you anything unless you actually, you know, we go into the details of what kind of pasta and all that. And I tend to like uh, sort of rigatoni, which is a short um, pasta and then sort of large, uh, you know, white and usually not with a red sauce. I, I cook my rigatoni with some kind of olive oil and with a bit of uh, Parmesan cheese, and that's it. Sounds delicious. <laughs> All right. So uh, this also might be related, but uh, or this might, might be an easy answer, but where's your favorite place you've ever been? That's a good question. I have actually a lot of places that I like and I like to go back to, but uh, because we're in part because we're talking about stoicism, but also because it really is one of my favorite places in the world, is Delphi. In, in Greece. Mm. I made a point actually during the, uh, the writing of the book. Uh, I had been in Delphi before, but during the writing of the book, uh, um, I occasionally took side trips to go and see uh, locations that were related to Epictetus in particular, not just to Stoicism in general, Epictetus in particular. So I went to Europolis, which is modern day Pamukkale in Turkey, where he was born and he spent his, the first part of his life. Then I went to Nicopolis, on the northwest part of Greece, which is where he uh, went after he was uh, exiled by the emperor uh, uh, Domitian. And um, uh, in doing that, in order to get to Nicopolis, I landed in uh, Athens, and then I rented a car, and I realized that exactly halfway between the ne and Nicopolis, in Athens and Nicopolis, it's Delphi. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I got to stop. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Delphi is, you know, if you go there, you understand immediately why the ancients thought that this was a sacred place. Uh, it's in the middle of the mountains. Uh, it's a, uh, it looks over a very deep gorge, uh, and it's not far from the sea. You can see the, the sea in the distance. It's just a magical place. And, of course, if you go there and look at the ruins of the Temple of Apollo, but especially my favorite place, even in Delphi, is the, the Temple of Athena. Uh, it's... It's just uh, un incredible. You just want, you have to be to go there in order to, to realize yeah. what, I'm, what I'm talking about. I'm actually going to be in Greece later this year, so oh. I will perhaps have to add it to the list. Uh, okay, last question, which is, if you could wave a magic wand and change any one thing, what would it be and why? Oh, that's a good question. I think I would wave off, uh, wave away, uh, so to speak, uh, inequality. Mm. I think inequality is the major source of strife and unhappiness um, among human beings. And so I would just say, whoop, gone. Yeah. Everybody's going to have more We're or less all the same. the same. And I'm talking on the high end or medium high end. And I'm, I'm, I want everybody to be poor because that's right. the other way to do it. <laughs> so let's make everybody poor. No, uh, I'm, I'm envisioning kind of a, uh, early, uh, uh, you know, a version of the early Star Trek where people don't mm. have to work because the, the, the things that they need is uh, they're made by a machine for them and they just can enjoy life. They have what they what they could possibly want and then they can decide what to do with their life. So yeah, I think inequality is the thing that I would do without. Great answer. All right, Massimo, I want to say thanks again for being on the show. The book is How to Be a Stoic Using Ancient Philosophy to Live a Modern Life. I would buy it as soon as possible. It is coming out May 9th. Is that That's correct? Right. Coming right up. So thanks again, Massimo, and uh, talk soon. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Read, Learn, Live. If you liked it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. If you hated it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. And so it goes. <laughs> <laughs>